go the direction you are painting before us. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. Thank you very much. We can sit down. Tonight is introductory to what we expect during these three days of revival. And tonight I want to look at a question in the Bible. And from that question we want to see what the scripture has to say on how you have eternal life, how you have a breakthrough, how you receive a miracle, how you re receive divine intervention. We're looking at Mark chapter 10 verse 17. Mark chapter 10 verse 17. And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Good master. Talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, everything about him was good. And he went about doing good, touching lives and healing the sick and saving the lost and delivering the oppressed. And this man recognized that Jesus Christ was a good master. He also knew that Jesus Christ knew the way into life eternal and the way into life in abundance and the way into the abundant blessings of the Lord. And so he came running and he said, good master, what shall I do? Is there anything I can do? Very, whether simple or hard, whether just taking a step or taking many steps, what can I do so that I inherit life eternal or eternal life? Before I come back to that question, I want to tell you, whatever we do in life or whatever we intend to do in life, it appears very tough and hard to some people. And true, if you do not know the way, everything looks hard, everything looks very tough. But if you know the way, and you know what you do. It looks very simple. That's why we're told in Ecclesiastes chapter 10 and in verse 15. If you do not know the way, everything seems complicated, seems clumsy. And you say, how can that happen? How can I have that? As we look at this man running to Jesus and he's saying, good master, what shall I do so that there is life eternal? You think about Peter, he got it already. And Matthew and a lot of those apostles, they had eternal life already because Jesus said, Father, all those who have given me, I've given them eternal life. So we know they had eternal life. And they found it very simple. But this man, as you read the whole story, found it very, very hard. In fact, he turned away in sadness because he couldn't find the way. The Lord told him the way, showed him the way, demonstrated the way, but he couldn't find that way because he couldn't find how to get into that which he sought. And that's why you, what you find about many people, other people just move in and it's very simple for them. Everything they're asking for, everything they're looking for, because they know that what Jesus says and the way he paints and points out, that way is very simple. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 10 verse 15. Ecclesiastes chapter 10 verse 15 It says the labor of the foolish Wearieth every one of them Because he knoweth not How to go to the city If you think about that city Where you have all the provision of the Lord Where you have all the eternal life And eternal blessing Abundant blessing Everything God has for you Have that picture in your mind That city is where you find everything he has And when people labor on their own how much the Pharisees labored and they never were able to get into that city. And how much the Sadducees also labored, they were not able to get into that city. And as you think about the religious people of the day, that is of the time of the Lord Jesus Christ, they tried quite a lot. In fact, they did some very tough, complicated things and yet they didn't have that which they were seeking. And uh, that other so bothered Paul the Apostle, when praying for the uh, Israelites, they said, I know them. They, they do quite a lot, and they try to get into that righteousness and into the blessing that the Lord had promised the patriarchs through the prophets, but they couldn't get it because they complicated everything, and today is still the same with many people. Many people, instead of just finding what has God said and what path or what pathway, as the Lord himself painted that this is the way, walk ye therein, and they go after 
the tradition of the fathers, after the religious tradition of the people, and that's what hindered the Pharisees, and it says, the labor of the foolish wearies every one of them, because they do not know how to go into the city of blessings. Let's come back to Mark chapter 10, verse 17. And when he was gone forth into the way, that is when Christ was gone into the way. He was actually moving ahead, making progress. This man, a rich man indeed, came to the Lord and he knelt down. You will think that actually he had respect for the Lord. He said, good master, called him a good name too. And then he wanted to know the greatest blessing he could have. That is eternal life. I said the greatest because that is the gateway to your breakthrough eternal life. That is the gateway into all the other blessings of God you might seek. You know, Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and, and what? And his righteousness. And then he said after that, all these other things will be added unto you. I think, uh, you know, that that's the problem with many people. All these other things, the minor things, the non-essentials, the temporary things, and uh, we are seeking for them. And then the major thing, which will be what we call the mother or the father of all blessings and the magnet for all miracles in your life. Have eternal life. And once you have that, that will draw to you all the other things you will ever need. And about this man now said, I want that thing the major thing, the main thing, the central thing that will then attract to me all the other blessings I might need. What shall I do that I might receive, I may receive or inherit eternal life? And I want you to concentrate on that because if you don't have that mindset and you're seeking for all the other things, you might have all the other things and if you don't have eternal life, might discover your fall men the most miserable. Let's look at Romans chapter 8, verse 32, just preparing the ground for you to know that this is the real thing. This is the central thing, eternal life. Life in Christ, salvation. And once you have that, all the other things will follow. You seek first the kingdom of God, and you seek first that righteousness that comes with your entering into the kingdom. And then he says, all these other things will be added unto you. Let's look at Romans chapter 8, verse 32. Romans 8, verse 32. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him, not apart from him, with him? He's giving us Christ. He's giving us life in Christ. He's giving us salvation in Christ. He's giving us righteousness in Christ. He's giving us the grace and the gift that comes through Jesus Christ. And he says, if he has given us Christ, he has given us the major thing. He has given us the thing that attracts all the other blessings into our lives. How then will he not give us with him freely all other things? How shall he not with him also freely give? give us all things. All things are available. They are available in Christ. When, once you get into salvation in Christ, then all the other things, they are available and you'll be able to have them. In Second Peter chapter 1 verse 3. Second Peter chapter 1 verse 3. According as his divine power, he has given unto us how many things? All things. Did you know that? Did you know that he has given unto us all things he has given? Not that he is going to give. You know, the attitude of uh, many people is that they are chasing after that which they've got already. And they're looking for what there is in their possession already. If you have the Lord Jesus Christ, the reason he came is that you have life, eternal life, as well as abundant life, that you may have life and that life more abundantly. And so he says, he has given unto us. And that's why you find, uh, you know, some people, they, they're in the church and they're in Christ, uh, apparently. But then, because they do not know what they have, they're searching in this place and that place how to have what they already possess. And here it says, according as his divine power, he has given us already all things that pertain unto life and to godliness. But it says, through the knowledge of him. 
that's the catch and that's the that's the thing you need to understand it's through the knowledge and my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge if you have the knowledge of the lord jesus christ what he has given us through christ once you have that salvation that eternal life the rest will follow and then it says uh, through the knowledge of him that has called us to what tell me out loud glory and virtue. You think the way some people are, the Lord has called them to disgrace and to dishonor and to something that is tasteless. But he said he has given unto us and he has called us. Not that he will call us. He's called us already to glory and to virtue. Not vice, not evil, not iniquity, not weakness, but unto virtue. And then he says in verse 4, whereby are given unto us. He's saying everything in the past participle. That is, he's saying, this is not in the future. This is not what you have when you get to heaven. This is not what you have when you become more mature. This is not what you have when you've read the whole Bible and studied everything just by coming into Christ. And having this life eternal, he has given unto us already exceeding great and precious promises that by these she might be partakers of even the divine nature. Think about that. That by all the things he has given us, we can even have the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through loss. Let's come back to our question. Good master, what shall I do? That I may inherit eternal life. Well, as you look at uh, the people that came to the Lord Jesus Christ wanting to have eternal life, he told this man this to make it applicable to him in particular. And he told another man this other thing to make it applicable to him. But if you put everything together and you say, what can, I, can you tell me in simple terms that I want eternal life? I want the way, make it simple, the divine pathway into eternal life. I'll simplify it by saying, number one, come out. Number two, come in. Number three, come now. If you understand all that, you can apply that to everyone. And if you want a healing, uh, we can say just come out and come in and come now. And if you want a breakthrough, and you can, you can just say, okay, how do, what do I do? I need a breakthrough in my life. I need a miracle in my life. And I just say, well, the steps to take is you come out, you come in, and you come now. You want salvation. And you want the Lord to forgive all your sins, all this guilt that bothers you, and all the condemnation that oppresses your mind. You say, I want to be free. I want to have life eternal. I say, why don't you just come out and then come in and come now? Because this is the day of salvation. It's not in the future. It can be at this very time. Now, as you look at the people in the Bible that came to the Lord Jesus Christ, and uh, some of them had healing, some of them got signs and wonders, some of them got deliverance, and some of them got their eyesight, how would you summarize what he did? I look at Bartimaeus, the blind man, and I can summarize everything he did. I think he came out, he came in, and he came just now, at that very time. And you think about the people like uh, Zacchaeus, that was a great sinner, and he wanted the salvation of the Lord and uh, all he did was that he came out he came into Christ and then he came just at that time it will not be tomorrow and if you will also apply that to your situation and you say simplify it for me I just want to touch the Lord now and I say one come out two come in three wrap it up by coming just now and let's look at what the Lord himself says. We're looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and I'm reading from verse, from verse 17. It says, Wherefore come out from among them. How does a sinner become a saint? Come out from among them. How does an unrighteous man become a righteous person? Come out from among them. How does a person that is overridden with guilt, with condemnation, and he has not found it possible to live a proper life, a clean life, and a life that is straightforward. And the Lord is saying, wherefore come out from among them. You buried yourself in some kind of bad habits, in some kinds of things that ruin you. 
it may be drug abuse it may be just you know some kind of character and behavior that it doesn't hurt other people as much as it hurts you and you're not able to live a happy life it may be that in your family between husband and wife you know if you make the wife happy she will also make you happy and if you create an atmosphere of uh, love and fellowship you'll enjoy that even though you knew that you do things that will make life not just miserable for other people but tough and miserable for you yourself and then after you've sown that bad seed evil seed and the seed is growing up and you are eating the bitter gall or the bitter evil thing that you have planted you go through life complaining and the Lord is saying, you can turn all that around. Everything can change. And all you need to do, point number one, is to come out. That is, look around you and say, instead of just blaming the whole world, they make life miserable for me. I'm not happy. I don't know about these people of the world. They don't even want good for anybody. Well, we've done enough blaming and condemning other people. They are my problems. They are my enemies. They will not allow me to progress. They are this and this. But I'm asking a question. I see that other people are living in the same community. And they seem to be having a happier life. And they seem to be having everything going along for them in life. And it's only you, and it's only me, or it's only us, that we're not having the peace and the joy and the fulfillment. And we're not having the satisfaction we ought to have in Christ. I think it's not just because of the world, it's because of who we are. And the Lord is saying, stop blaming the world and look at the blame and the faults and the problem at your doorstep. And he's saying that the very first thing you do is come out. You know, a house is burning and somebody is inside there is crying out. He's saying, help me, help me. I'm born in here, and uh, you know, I'm going to die over here. My enemies have kindled the fire, and the roof is burning. It's going to collapse on me. And then he hears a voice outside. It's very simple. Why are you just crying out there? Come out. That's how you get out of the fire, how you get out of the problem, how you get out of whatever it is that is bothering you. And so the Lord is saying it's very simple. Remember, the labor of the foolish wearies every one of them. And the first thing to be done is the last thing people ever do. They will fast, they will pray, they'll drink oil, they'll take water, they will, you know, go to the mountain top, they'll go to the valley, they'll read the Bible, they read a particular chapter of the Bible 21 times, and they will do quite a lot of things, but they stay there. They never come out. And then after the 21 days fasting, and after all the things they have done, they still see that the problems are there. It's like that man in the burning house. He does, you know, he stays there inside the burning house, and he repeats some 23, 50 times, but he's staying inside there. And then he's also reading a lot of the Bible, and he's kneeling down, he's raising his hands to the Lord, or he's singing songs, so he's uh, you know, quoting references of the Bible, or he's making what we call post positive confession but he stays inside the burning house and we say hey positive confession is good and all those affirmations are wonderful and reading some 23 in number of times that is great but you know no matter how many times you read that psalm if you don't come out the burning house will collapse on you therefore the very first thing the lord is saying is saying come out look at that verse 17 wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate says who again it says the lord you know if you went to a priest he'll say something according to the tradition of his religion if you go to a religious denominational minister, he'll say something according to his own understanding of the tradition of his religion. He might say well, he said, what your problem is, territorial spirit, or this other one, or this other one, and therefore go and do this and pray this way, and give you a lot of do's and don'ts. If you could do that, then everything will be all right. And the problem is, at our surprise, we've done all these things, and the problems are still there. Because we didn't understand, thus says the Lord. And the Lord said, it's simpler than you are taking it. Just like uh, uh, Pastor Chidoze from London just said now, uh, over these uh, weeks we've seen remarkable things, remarkable things. And, and it's very simple. And if you, you know, as I'm here now, you wouldn't have known that I, you know, that I was uh, going around in Nigeria from Tuesday last week till Sunday. 
and they preach and saw crowds of people and you know blind eyes opening and the lame rising and walking because it's not my gimmicks it's not my running up and down or exerting energy i just tell them the very simple thing i say come out and as many as do that just like that their miracles come and their breakthroughs come and if you'll take these simple things and just say okay i understand i understand come out of that burning house that's very simple and then once you are out of the burning house or into fresh air and then you'll be looking at that house and then you'll say thank god i came out when you come out you'll say you might say thank god it was a grace of god that i escaped that is true you had to come out. I thank God. It was the shout of that man. He shouted at me and said, come out. And that shout woke me up. And I give all the credit to the shout of that man. I understand. That is true. But all the shouting that the man did would not have saved you from that burning house if you didn't personally take the step to come out. And then you might say, is the sovereignty of God that brought me out. You know, if God were not sovereign, and God did not manifest his power, I would have born in that. I understand, I accept that. That is true. But with all the sovereignty of God, if you didn't come out, you're still born in that place. I think we need to understand the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man. Yes, he's powerful. Yes, he's mighty. He can do all things. But he himself said, this is what you do. And we, if we do what he tells us to do, we're going to have the result. I said you are going to have the result. So it says, Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. I will be a father unto you. What's the implication of that? Everything the father has will belong to you. What if your father was uh, a great uh, medical doctor and expert, and is healing other people outside, and you are his son? And he specializes in taking away all these sicknesses from other people. Of course, because you are a child of God, he'll easily take it away from you. What if your father is a philanthropist, that is, you know, educating other people, sending them to school, spending money on them, and giving thousands of pounds to other people, and you are his son or daughter? Of course, he's going to give unto you too. And he says, if you want me to have the relationship of father-child or child-to-father with you, all you need to do is come out. And as you come out, you've taken the first step, you'll be all right tonight. I said you'll be all right tonight. But uh, what if, uh, you know, sometimes you come to a gathering like this, and, and I say, uh, this is the word of God, step number one, come out. And I'm going to give you the chance to make that practical, because this is not something theoretical. It is not something you say, well, uh, we've had it, I understand it. It's not the understanding, it's the action. Intention without action makes you a zero. It is intention with action that makes you a hero. That you say, yes, I got it because I added action to my intention. What if, uh, you know, come back to the burning house again. The house is burning. And then I shout at you, hey, come out. And then you are thinking, yes, I will come out. But, uh, you know, all these other people are watching. I don't want to come out in the presence of other people. I'm going to, I know that's the right thing to do. And at the right time, I'm going to do that. But not now. When other people have gone, at my own time, I will come out. You might be burnt up before your time comes. This is the time to do it. I said this is the time to do it. And that is the path of wisdom. Come out is number one. What's number two? come in. Uh, you know, all those people that came out of the land of Canaan, as out of the land of uh, Egypt, not many of them came in into the promised land. It's one thing to come out, and it's the next step to come in. In fact, the Bible says that he brought them out that he might bring them in. Never forget that. You know, there are people, there are, you know, some people, church people, and they say, I don't do this, I don't do this, I don't do this. The implication is, I came out of this, I came out of this. I'm waiting for you to tell me what you do. You know, some people, all the way you can describe them is, I don't, I don't, I don't. But why don't you go beyond that and say, I do this, I do this, I do so that I will know, number one, you are out, but number two, you are in. Is that simple. 
when you come out of a particular place, you come into another place. What if you wanted to buy something in the market or in the groceries, and then you came out of your house, and that's all you did. You never came into the groceries. You have nothing. It's not just that you came out. Coming out, of course, is necessary. What if your child wants to get good quality education, and therefore he comes out of the house, but he never gets into the school? If he comes out, he has to come in. And if you come out of darkness, you have to come into the light. If you come out of sin, you have to come into the Savior. If you come out of all those problems and the predicaments, you have to then come into the solution that the Lord has given us. Is the combination of those two. You come out and you come in. That's what gives you what you are looking for. You will get it in Jesus' name. In Luke chapter 14, verse 23. Luke chapter 14, verse 23. And the Lord said unto the servant. Have you noticed that these references I'm reading to you, they are what the Lord himself said. This is not the opinion of a religious a priest, a religious leader, or anybody. This is the word of the Lord himself. And it says, the servant said, uh, in the sorry, the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and edges and compel them to do what? To come in. Compel them to come in that my house may be filled. That house there is a kingdom. He's saying that here is the house of the Lord. Here is the kingdom of God. Here is the uh, place where you have all the provision of the Lord. And you're going to compel them to come in. How do you compel them to come in? That word compel, actually in the original, means convince them to come in. It means persuade them to come in. Uh, the compulsion here is not with a whip. It's not that, you know, you have a whip in your hand and then you want to, you know, give them some lashes to compel them to come in. It's by persuasion. Isn't that how we get saved? We are saved by the foolishness of preaching. As you know, simple as the word is, and it appears too simple that some might even say, Isn't that foolish? If, if that is all, uh, you know, come out and come in. If it's simple, why couldn't you do it? If it's so simple, why did it you take the steps? Maybe you are saying it's simple, and after all, it's not as simple as that. I think it's a chaos. If you ask a chaos, and he said, I came out, that takes courage. Because everybody knew that Zacchaeus was a wicked man, a sinful man, a corrupt man. And then he came to the public, and then he said, half of my goods I give to the poor. If I've taken anything by wrong accusation, I come out of that kind of character, and I'm coming into a new lifestyle. It takes courage. And don't just say that that is too simple. If it is too simple, then take the steps. Take the steps. And then you are going to have the blessings of the Lord upon your life in Jesus' name. Compel them. Persuade them. Convince them to come in. And all the people that ever got saved, they were convinced they ought to come in. They ought to come into Christ. They ought to come into salvation. They ought to come into life eternal. And they came out of where they were. And sometimes it's tough coming out of religious bigotry. Coming out of that. Sometimes it's very tough. You might say that's very simple. In fact, at the time of Jesus Christ, there were people that knew they should come out. But then they were afraid. If we come out and we declare our stand, then they will drive us away from the synagogue. And that price was too heavy for them, too great for them to pay. And because of that, many of them remained in their sin, in their evil. But as you say, whatever the cause, I am coming out. Not only that, I am coming in. I'm persuaded. If I come into Christ, in Christ, all things are provided for me. In Christ, there is healing. In Christ, there's miracle. In Christ, there's deliverance. All I need to do is come out of darkness, come into the light. I'm compelled, I'm convinced, I'm persuaded. I'm going to come in, and as you come in, it will be yours in Jesus' name. And then, number three, is to come now. Is to come now. And you know that sometimes um, five minutes delay can mean uh, losing something that is very, very precious to you. And there are times uh, you find somebody wants to catch the train. He wants to go for an interview. He's well prepared. 
is uh, he believes that if he gets to that place he's uh, read this and even investigated found out uh, what questions they're likely to ask he's very well prepared but he's you know taking this and taking this and taking that and eventually by the time he comes out of the house and by the time he tries to get into the train the train is gone just the five minutes delay can cost you that job and sometimes it's uh, you know you need to take a decision and you need to act right there and have the blessings of god upon your life and just a little delay and you know i'm still thinking each over what he deceived on the cross think about this now jesus was right on the cross and this thief was there and the other thief was there and uh, the thieves they were discussing once said if you are the master if you're a good person you are the son of god why don't you get us now out of this cross the other fellow said why do you talk like that we're suffering for our own sins but he is a just man a righteous man and then all that did not get him into the kingdom or into paradise but he needed to say lord remember me when you come into your kingdom but I'm just asking you a question now. What if uh, he had waited for just five minutes? And he's still thinking it over. I'm going to tell the Lord, remember me when you get into your kingdom. And I want to get to that kingdom of God. I realize I'm a sinner. And I realize that you are the Savior. I'm coming out. I'm coming in. But what if he did not come now? Just delayed a few minutes. Where would he have spent eternity? And you understand that uh, the issues of eternity, a long time beyond calculation, uh, could be decided by just the, that moment, that decision of that moment. Do you remember that Jesus Christ was going from uh, Jericho, going out of Jericho, and this was blind Bartimaeus, and uh, he began to cry, Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And he wanted to receive a sight. What if he just felt, I can do that anytime. Jesus is always there and opportunities are always there. If I don't get it now, I might get it another time. That man might remain blind for the rest of his life. The decision you need to take at the right time, and you take that decision and say, this is the time. And when you ought to take that decision, you take it, it's going to bring blessing into your life in Jesus' name. You know, you found people that just said, I'm thinking it through. I'm, I'm waiting for the right moment and for the right feeling. And when that right feeling comes, then I will know what to do. And sometimes the feeling never comes. And the Lord just wants you to be able to say, it is now. You come out, you come in, and number three is what? You come now. Look at Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18 it says come now and let us reason together says the Lord is the Lord again telling us is the Lord that said come out is the Lord that said come in and is the Lord that is saying come now this is the time it's the time again let me remind you I've found people that you know they talk about getting saved and wanting to have eternal life and they just you know stay there and they're screaming and they're crying and I'm, I'm trying to tell them that, you know, it's not, not screaming. You can scream all you want to. If you don't take the right, the simple steps to come out of where you have been and to come into what Christ has provided and to come now. All that kind of emotional turmoil in your heart and all the struggling and all the fighting and all the beating the air and all the kind of gymnastics uh, when you pray, all that doesn't mean anything. It's the action to come out and come in and come now and take the right step at the right time. Hey, that's, the, that's the thing that really matters. So that we really understand that this is the step I need to take. But you, you know, uh, there are uh, sometimes, uh, let me come back to uh, the example or illustration of the burning house. Uh, you know, there are sometimes that people are inside a burning house. And they know that it's very dangerous for them to remain there. You could, you know, lose your life and you could just be burnt up like that. But there are some other people, they are very active. They are telling other people, do 
through something and they himself are in that fire. Don't you think that you yourself, to save your own life, you come out first and then from outside, you can do a lot for the people that you need to compel, convince and persuade to come out themselves. But if you stay inside that same fire and then you are telling other people, this is what you do and that is what you do, how about that? Reminds me of the time before I ever got saved. I wasn't born again, but I was religious and I was, you know, busy telling other people, you know, you need to come out of this and come out of this and come out of that. Whereas myself, I need to do that too. And of course, I couldn't help anybody. I just gave them the theoretical scene because I didn't have the practical scene to show that really you can come out and this is what happens in your life. But And since I came out myself and then came in and I came at the right time, I've been able to help other people. I want to say that religious activities will not do. This moment of the breakthrough, this day, so today, tomorrow, and uh, you know after tomorrow, uh, the important times for every one of us. And if you will just say, I'm going to take care of my personal uh, breakthrough, and then I'll be able to help other people, I believe that that will be the way of wisdom. Don't you think? I said, don't you think? Yes, that's the path of wisdom. And the Lord said, come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Then he says, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. And though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And then it says in verse 19, tell me verse 19. Uh, let me remind you once again about, you know, the people that, they, they think that this, you know, we respect God, we honor God, we exalt the name of the Lord, and we say God can do everything, but we do nothing. We can, what can we do? We're just a weak uh, human beings. What can we do? Everything belongs to him. Everything is on his side. He can save us. He can heal us. He can deliver us. He can do whatever it is he wants to do. But you know what God himself said? The Lord himself said, it's not just me. Yes, I can. But he doesn't force his salvation on us. He doesn't force his healing on us. He doesn't force his uh, will on us. He said, if you be willing and obedient, he says, you will eat the good of the land. What's that telling me? It's telling me that, yes, God is sovereign. God is powerful. God is mighty. But then I have some responsibilities too. I need to take some steps too. When Jesus said to Peter, follow me, I will make you fishers of men. What if he just stayed there and said, oh, you are Jesus, you can make me do it. And anytime you want, you can compel me to do it and almost use your sovereignty and make me do it. But he left his nails and actually did what the Lord told him to do. What if when God, when Jesus called Matthew and then he was to leave what he was doing and follow after Jesus, what he said, oh Lord Jesus, anytime you want to, you can, you can save me, you can forgive me, everything is in your hand. What am I, what can I do since you are the sovereign one, the sovereign Lord? But you have a responsibility. And the Lord is saying, come out, come, come in, and come now. The word come is a verb, and it sets you in motion. And it makes you to say, yes, I'm deciding. So I have to decide. I have to determine. And I have to say, yes, I'm going to take the steps. And then Jesus said, whosoever comes to me. See that. It's not saying, whosoever I force to come, but whosoever of his own volition, comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. And when you do that, that's going to be the beginning of great breakthrough and blessing your life in Jesus' name. Give me a good amen. amen. But you know, sometimes you think this is very simple. And you know, it's because many people have complicated the message of the gospel. And when we do this, I believe that the miracle will come upon us in Jesus' name. You might have heard the story before. I'll tell you again, uh, you know, to just to refresh your memory if you've heard it before. I found a woman that time who went to the village evangelizing. And uh, the, the child was paralyzed and lame, you know, ju just there, helpless. And she was running around uh, and overturned the porch uh, like an idol. And then she would bow down, then run a little bit and bow down, run a little bit and bow down. And I said, Madam, what are you doing? Oh, she said, I'm worshiping my God. I said, where is your God? He said, but look at it now. Don't you see? This is my God. 
and uh, so I said, but see what your God has done to your child, that your child is paralyzed, and uh, if you will do what I'm telling you, come out of that thing, and come into the, you know, mercy of the Lord, and do it now, come now, I believe that this child will be healed. What I mean is, take that pot, which you call a God, smash it on the ground, and break it, and get rid of it, and then I'll pray for your child, and the child will get up. And so the woman said, no, um, you pray for my child first. After, if that child gets up, then I will do what you have said. I said, no, you, you, know, you don't allow your students to dictate the syllabus for you, do you? You are the teacher, and you are the preacher, and the pastor will say, no, that is what you do. You do that, and then this will happen. After he, you know, kind of uh, argued for some time, and then she saw that I wasn't bulging, then she decided, all right, I'll, I'll give it a shot, I'll, I'll do that. And then she took the thing, an empty pot that had nothing inside, and smashed it on the ground. I said, there you are. Anything you can break, that cannot be God. If you can break up that thing, it's not God. And so she smashed it on the ground. After she did that, you know what that interpreted to? It means come out. She came out of idolatry. She came into the grace of God, into the pure worship of the Lord. And she did it now. She came at that time. Come out. Come in. Come now. And then I just stood there saying, in the name of Jesus, child, rise up and walk. And to her surprise, that child rose up immediately. What if, uh, you know, she still had all that, and then the child would have been there. And she could have lost that miracle for a long time. But I believe that this is your time. I said, this is your time. And so I'm, you're, you're going to, you are the one to, you know, come out. I, I convinced you, I persuade you, I compel you to come in. But you are the one to take the step. And you are the one to do it now. And it says, if ye be willing, it's not, it didn't say that if Isaiah was willing, Isaiah was already willing. He told them what the Lord wanted him to tell them. And I have told you what the Lord wants me to tell you is now on your side. I believe you are going to take the step. I said you'll take the step. If he be willing and obedient, he shall eat the good of the land. To eat the good of the land, what is that? That's what you call breakthrough. That's what you call abundant blessing. That's what you call enjoyment. That's what you call a new experience. That's what you call eradicating all the things that bother you until this point and having the goodness of the Lord in your life. And that thing can start tonight. I said it can start tonight by you come out, then you come in, and you come when? Let's bow our heads for, for prayer. You'll take the steps. Remember, if you be willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. It doesn't take um, crying. It doesn't take screaming. It doesn't take uh, injuring yourself. It doesn't take, you know, going to the seaside or doing anything funny or anything so tough and difficult. Just come out. Come in. Come now. And the quietness of your heart between you and the Lord. You say, Lord, I've had your word. I know, I know the negative things in my life. I know the things I do. I know the things that are wrong. In my character, my behavior, my lifestyle. Lord, I want to take those simple steps now. Come out among them. You separate, says the Lord. I really want to come in into the light, into the kingdom, into Christ, into his salvation, into the kingdom. And I'm doing it now. No more delay. Then I believe that when I've done that, all the blessings you want to give me are available, I'm going to have them. In Jesus' name we pray. It's about a nice close. If you are taking those steps and you really want to get into that eternal life and that salvation, that forgiveness, and you want uh, God to begin something great and something major in your life, as we go through this period of breakthrough, you are taking those steps, you are willing, you are obedient, you come out, you come in, you come now. You raise up your hand so I can pray with you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. If I raise up your hand, we're going to, why don't you, those, only those who are raising up their hands will stand up. I need to connect with you and pray with you to know that you are there. You want that blessing of the Lord and that eternal life. If you are raising up your hand, thank you very much. Just, just stand up. Thank you. 
you raise up your hand, just, just stand up. Thank you. As you, raise, as you are standing up, just quite clear between you and the Lord, just, just tell the Lord the things you have recognized. That, that's, that's the thing ruining my life. That's the thing that is kind of uh, destroying me. That's what is making the house, my home, to almost burn down on me. Just, just tell the Lord, I come out of those things. That's your responsibility. Repentance is our responsibility. Forgiveness is God's prerogative. And then tell the Lord as you come out of those things by His grace, you also come in into His forgiveness, into His eternal life, into His joy, the joy of salvation, the joy of life eternal. And that, of course, you are standing up. It's because you are coming now. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for this, my brothers and sisters, who have taken the bold step to come out, to come in, and to come now. I pray, Lord, that your forgiveness will come into them in Jesus' name. Peace of mind will come into them in Jesus' name. I'm asking, Lord, that that eternal life, that salvation, that righteousness will provide it for everyone that will come out, come in, and come now. I pray it will be theirs right now in Jesus' name. And I pray that this will be the beginning of great power, great miracle, great breakthrough in their lives in Jesus' name. I pray that your peace will grant them the assurance that the work has been done. The blessing has been given. The willingness has brought them into the goodness of your kingdom. And this they will never miss in their lives in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And everybody said... Now, let's every, let everybody stand up now. We're going to all pray together. If you need any breakthrough in your life, any miracle, any healing, any deliverance, any challenge that you're telling the Lord, Oh Lord, I come out of my personal struggles, uh, trying to uh, kind of uh, manage myself, all the self-management. I come out of that. I put everything in your hand, and I come into your goodness and your grace right now. You need any healing, any miracle, you raise up your hand, we'll pray together. You identify the problem, identify the sickness, the challenge, and then you utter the prayer, you check up yourself, you see that the Lord has done the work he specializes in doing. Raise up your hand if you need any touch of the Lord for a miracle, for healing, for deliverance, for any particular breakthrough, identify the problem and say, Lord, I know this is what I need. And this is the time to have it done. Father, in the name of Jesus, we bless your name. We know you are a great God. With you, all things are possible. I bring all my brothers and my sisters before you. You know, Lord, what the affliction is, what the challenge is, what the problem is, what the sickness, the disease is. Therefore, Lord, I pray you touch them with your miracle working hand right now in Jesus' name. And I pray that the pain, the disease, the infirmity, you touch them and take everything away right now in Jesus' name. Lord, you are the same. You have not changed. You say, you said, I am God. I change not. And we know that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Therefore, Lord, we're praying that that same power you manifested in days gone by and the signs and wonders that you did in days gone by, that you repeat the same in this place tonight in Jesus' name. Therefore, all those uh, demonic powers or diseases troubling, tormenting anyone there, I command you, get out in Jesus' name. And all the things that oppose your progress and wants to destroy, uh, your moving on to the abundance of the Lord and the breakthrough, I take them out of your pathway now in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray that you put the devil to shame in their lives, that your goodness will flow into their lives in Jesus' name. And I pray that the healing virtue of the Lord Jesus Christ will pass into your body, pass into your system, and wash out and clean off all those painful, evil things in Jesus' name. Turn everything around tonight, Lord. Walk the miracle right now. And do the incredible, the impossible. That your people will know that your power is still the same, even in this place tonight. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray.
Praise the Lord. Praise the living Jesus. We thank the Lord for the message we've just heard. And if you heard what I heard, this is just part one. How many of you picked that up? The message tonight is just part one. It's a series. So the foundation has been laid. And now the building is going to come on the foundation. Amen? Praise the Lord. So what you have now is the first course. Right? So the second course is tomorrow. And then the third course is on Friday. Uh, tonight we do not have much time left here. Uh, but we still want to give opportunity. If you've checked up yourself, the prayer has been made. It's as simple as that. God works in a very quiet, silent, wonderful way. So if you want to check yourself and you see what God has done and you want to testify, you want to take that testimony tonight before we leave. But before the testimony is kicking, uh, we want to announce that by the grace of God, tomorrow at 7 p.m., we want to start here. Today we had a bit of a late start, and uh, we don't want that to repeat tomorrow. So we need to get here on time, and all those we have invited who couldn't make it tonight, we should encourage them and tell them something good is happening in Liverpool, and that always should lead to the lighthouse. Amen? That everyone should be at the lighthouse. That's where the light of the gospel is shining the brightest in Liverpool in these three days. Amen? And I believe that as you compel them, like we have been told, you persuade them, you convince them, they will meet with God right here. Amen? So, if we have testimonies to tell, I mean to give, please, wherever you are, if you indicate by raising your hand, one of the ushers will come to you, will vet your testimony very quickly, and will take it even tonight before we leave. Anyone here tonight, God has touched you and you know it for real. Amen? So just raise up your hand where you are and we'll ask one of the ushers to come to you. Hear that testimony so that I can give it before the people of God. So to help us uh, handle this testimony time, I will hand over to Pastor Chidoze. I want us to check ourselves and see what God has done. If you do feel or sense the physical healing of God, you can put your hands up. No, it's quite exciting when I think of the way the Lord helps our general superintendent and how things happen. One in one crusade, somebody came, um, was paralyzed, and could not walk as they were going into the vehicle. As they got into the vehicle, sorry, they got into the vehicle, then the other people jumped out and they were now planning to find a way to bring the crippled man out. And before they know it, the man jumped out and started walking. And I'm believing God for you that some of us here may not have noticed it tonight, but by tomorrow. I said tomorrow. I said tomorrow, and I'm believing God that as tonight is the starting point, the testimonies of what happened here tonight will hear them tomorrow in Jesus' name. And I'm believing that the grace of God that has started here tonight will abound for the rest of this program. You may not have got your own package tonight, but are you still expecting? The delivery man might be knocking tomorrow evening. I say he might be knocking on the door on the, your own door tomorrow evening. And I'm expecting my big package. 
Let's all stand up on our feet. Now, before we say the final grace, you know, some people came out to come in and to come now, this night. Now, we want, if you made that decision, and that decision is genuine, we want you to come to the front as a physical symbol of showing that I have come out and I've come in. So you're physically coming out of your seat. I want you to move. If you are one of those who stood up, put your hands up. I want you to stand up. I mean, take your bags or whatever you come in with and come to the front seat. Yeah, there is a special seat for you. And it won't take your time before we close. Can we please give them time and space so that they can come out, please? Come to the front seat. If you made that decision when the Father and the Lord was here, and he um, prayed for you or with you. Can I ask you to please come to the front seat? That's to show that you meant your decision. There are seats in front. Thank you for coming. Just keep coming. We are just patient with you. You know, as you have come to the front, you will be in front for the rest of your life. You will never know behind again. So if there's anybody who put his hand up or who stood up and made that decision, you better come to the front so that you'll have forward ever in your life. I say you'll have forward ever in your life. Now, are we expecting something here tomorrow? How many people are expecting something here tomorrow? I'll be here tomorrow. But then we're going to say, God, pass me not by. Tomorrow evening, Pass me not by. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord. I say, Lord, tomorrow it will be better than today. And the things that God has already done will come into full manifestation. I want us to pray for our general superintendent that God will use him mightily tomorrow than tonight. Let's pray that God's power, favor, fullness will touch our general superintendent. Let's also pray for the other guests who are supposed to be here, that God will touch them to come tomorrow. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's share the grace in fellowship. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Surely, goodness and mercy God bless you. Now, please, those of you who are in front here, I want you to just wait for a few moments. I would, uh, would come and see, see you for two minutes, not more than two minutes. See you all tomorrow evening. God bless you.